Hey everyone, this is Rohan Shah with bestdecontutor.com and in this video we'll be talking about risk, asymmetric information, and present value. Now let's first talk about risk. Imagine that somebody, you know, wants to help you out financially and they give you two options. They say, hey, I could just give you $5,000. No questions asked, no strings attached. That's one option. Or another option they'll present to you is, you know, how about let's flip a fair coin. If you get a head, heads, I'll give you $10,000. But if you get tails, I'll give you zero. Try to think about what you would do in that scenario. Would you like the one option, option B, let's call it, where you get just the $5,000, or option A, where it's the heads or tails. You might get $10,000, or you might get zero. You know, Here's the thing. There's not a single right answer to that. Different people will answer it in different ways. Some people might even say that they're completely indifferent between the two options, and they really can't choose, and they give them the same happiness level. Now, here's the thing. Based on how people make this decision, you can sometimes tell whether they're what we're going to call risk averse, risk neutral, or risk loving. So here's the thing. Any person in the world, for any given number, you can sort of determine what type of risk profile they have. Are they risk loving, risk neutral, or risk averse? Now, in this scenario, one thing to be able to calculate one one good thing that you should know how to calculate for all these questions to be able to tell what type of risk profile you are is you need to be able to calculate the expected value it's really a fancy way of saying the average but we're gonna weigh it by different amounts as we'll we'll get to so here it's simple enough because the expected value of option a the expected value of option a is just well let's see 50 percent of the time we're going to get zero dollars, so it's 0.5 times zero, plus 50% of the time you're going to get 10,000, so 10k. So, by the way, if you're not familiar with it from earlier, the formula for the expected value of x is really just, it looks messy at first, scary at first, but it's really the sum of p of x times x. So really what that's saying is, to find the expected value, the sort of average, it's like, you know, 50%, that's the P of X times the amount that you get, zero, plus, that's the sum, and the same thing. So here, there was only two options, so it's 0.5 times that amount, plus 0.5 times how much you get in that other case. So here, if we do the math, we just get 5,000, because it's uh, zero times anything is zero, and half, 0.5 times 10,000 is that. So the expected value, on average, you can expect to get by grand, right? Because it's really you're averaging zero and ten thousand equally, so you could just add them up and divide it by two, but that won't always work if they're not equally likely. Here, heads and tails are equally likely, but here, the expected value of B, let's see, there's just a hundred percent probability, so one, that you're going to get five thousand dollars, and that's it, that's all that's happening. So, really, the expected value is five thousand. So, here, these two options have the exact same expected value. Whenever we have that scenario, that's when you can definitely tell what type of person they are based on which option they choose. If two things have, you know, a different expected value and they choose the one with the higher expected value, you really can't tell whether they're risk averse, risk loving, risk neutral, but if they have the exact same expected value, then you can definitely tell that the person who picks the riskier option where you might get more or you might get less, they're risk loving. The person who picks the safer option would be risk averse, and the person who's totally indifferent, they just can't choose, they're risk neutral. So one thing we can generalize is anyone who's risk neutral will always simply pick the option with the higher expected value. So if you're risk neutral, how do you operate? You're just like, oh, on average, I'll get about five grand here, here, I'll get about five grand, so I really don't care. Now a risk averse person, that's what I am personally, that's probably what most of you are, You'd look at these two and you'd say, hmm, they're about the same expected value. Do I really want to risk getting zero? Sure, I could get 10,000, but you know what? It's much safer if I just get the five for sure. That way I don't have any regrets, you know. Sure, you know, I, I, about getting zero. So 
that's me. I would personally pick option B, which means I am risk averse. Now you might have somebody who's like, ah, who cares really about the 5,000? I might as well just like, you know, try to get the 10. And if I lose, man, you know, I'll, at least I had the chance of getting the 10. So they would pick option A and they're risk loving. So that's how you can tell what type of person you are. But again, on the other hand, if we were to switch these numbers around, if, if we were to make this now, uh, you know, 100,000 or something like that, right? Now the expected value here is 50,000. Now even a risk averse person like me might still choose option A and uh, that's, that's still consistent. It doesn't mean you're risk loving necessarily because you just pick the one with the higher uh, expected value. Uh, and so you might pick the one with the higher expected value regardless of what type you are. But if you're risk neutral, then you definitely know you'd pick this one. Now here's a question for you. Why would anyone want to maybe ever buy insurance and how do insurance companies make profits? Like how does that even work if they're, you know, paying out money a lot? Well, let's take a scenario where you have a risk averse person who just bought a car and they have a 10% chance of getting into an accident. Now if they get into an accident, let's say they have to pay $10,000 in damages if they just total their car. But 90% of the time, they're not getting into an accident and they have to pay $0 in car expenses. So let's think about whether they might want to buy insurance or not. Now here, what is their expected expense? The expected expense, the expected value we could say is, let's see, 90% of the time, they have to pay zero plus 10% of the time, they have to pay 10,000. So really that's zero times anything is zero. 0.1 times 10,000 is 1,000. So um, on average, I'm expecting to pay about $1,000. Notice it was really averaging zero and 10,000, but it wasn't just five because we wanted to give a lot more weight to the zero. So it ended up being a lot closer to zero. But either way, I'm expecting, let's say I'm a risk averse person and I'm facing these numbers and I'm deciding, should I buy car insurance or not? And uh, I know that, all right, on, on average, I'm expecting to pay out, you know, uh, $1,000. But what if somebody else were to offer me what's called fair insurance? So if somebody were to offer me a fair premium, an actuarially fair, that's the full name, actuarially fair premium of $1,000. What if they were to say, all right, how about this? Rohan, you know, how about you just have to pay me $1,000 and uh, that's it. If your car gets total, we'll cover the full $10,000. And I'm thinking, hey, you know what? Either way, I've got the same expected value by taking the risk on my own versus just buying insurance. So if I'm a risk averse person, I would get way more happiness, utility out of this than out of this, even though they have the same expected value. See, if I were a risk neutral person, I really wouldn't care. But I'm risk averse, so I would prefer to just pay an insurance company $1,000 no matter what. So that way, if my car gets totaled, I never am stuck with the $10,000 bill. Now, why would an insurance company want to take me up on this offer? Well, because they're thinking 90% of the time, you know, they're actually getting, uh, they're getting the thousand, but they don't have to pay anything because 90% of the time I don't get into an accident. So in that case, they just earn a thousand dollars. And, uh, but 10% of the time they do have to pay out a lot. And so they would in that case lose uh, $10,000. On average though, they're breaking even. They're not really making a loss because they're on average 10% of the time, you know, paying that, 90% of the time that. So that, that balances out. They're making zero profit now. But here's the thing. You can now actually, so from their perspective, because I'm risk averse, if they did want to make a profit, they actually could make a little bit of a profit by, uh, by charging me a slightly higher premium. What if they charge me like, like 1100 instead, right? In my mind, I'm thinking, hmm, even though this is like, and it's weird though here, since we're looking at the expense, we, I want the lower expected value technically. So if I was risk neutral though, I would definitely pick the thousand over the 1100, right? Cause I want to ex have a lower expense, but since I'm risk averse, I'd be willing to pay, you know, an extra hundred if it means that's it, that I'll never ever be stuck with a $10,000 bill. So I'd rather in my mind, even though the averages I'm paying a little bit more on average, in my mind, I'm okay paying $1,100 every year, no matter what, rather than you know waking up and saying, do I have to pay zero or 10,000? Is my car totaled or not? So rather than me living with, living with the risk, I'd rather, it's, it's like I'm paying a premium to be able to not have the risk. So 
at the end of the day, if I were to, if they were to offer me this, I would probably take them up on that insurance. And that way I'm safe in my mind. I pay 1100. I never have to worry. And in their mind, here's the thing about the insurance company. I'm not their only client. So one way they eliminate their risk is by what's called, uh, you know, pooling. So what they can do is they can offer insurance like this to thousands and thousands of people across the country. And now on average, you know, they are on average getting 1100 bucks from their customers. And on average, they're paying out a thousand because they're now taking that risk. So on average, they are making about a hundred bucks per person. Again, on any individual person they might have lost, uh, on any individual person they might have won in the sense that they didn't have to pay anything, but they got their 1100 bucks. But either way, on average, because you do it over thousands and thousands of people, on average, they probably are going to make a lot of money and profit. So that's one way to eliminate their risk. Now, another way in general to avoid risk is what's called diversification. So that's like if you're investing in the stock market rather than, let's say you have $1,000 and you're wondering, hmm, should I buy $1,000 worth of Google stock or Apple stock, right? Because you're thinking, if you're thinking one of them might like totally double and you're going to double your money, then you're kind of like, all right, uh, you're kind of worried because what if you invest in Google, but then the other company was the one that doubled, not this one, you know? What if you invested in the wrong one? So one thing you can do is just split your money. 500 in, 500 in Google, 500 in Apple. That way at least you're guaranteed that half of your money will double if, if you knew, for example, that one of them was gonna double and you just didn't know which one. So in general, diversifying is one way you can kind of uh, get risk averse results, you know, without having to actually take the risk, so. Now let's talk a little bit about asymmetric information. That's when one party usually has more information than the other. It's not symmetric, asymmetric. Now, there's a lot of vocab words kind of that you'll learn that it's kind of, uh, people really tend to confuse these two. Adverse selection and moral hazard. Most students kind of don't know the difference between the, these two. It kind of seems like something about, you know, uh, stuff going wrong. And they both are related to something going wrong when there's asymmetric information. But let's look at what the difference is and how to, you know, really treat them in the real world. So let's keep a consistent example. Let's say you are thinking about, you own a health insurance company, okay? And uh, let's say you know that some people are healthy, you know, they exercise, they eat well, and so they're less likely to get certain diseases, and so you're less likely to have to spend a lot of money on them, right? Uh, versus some people are unhealthy, and so you're expecting to probably spend more money on them because, again, when you're the health insurance company, you're now kind of, you're paying for all their medical uh, bills and they're just giving you a monthly premium or something. So you're kind of taking their risk for them if you're the insurance company. Now, what if you knew that you were able to distinguish between healthy and unhealthy people? Then you'd kind of want to charge the healthy people a lower premium, right? Because that's the fair thing to do if you're, you know, spending less uh, money for them. So you charge them less versus charge more for the unhealthy people. So let's say you just said, hey, you know what? I'm just going to ask people. I'm going to have them fill out a survey asking them, hey, you know, uh, how many times a week do you exercise? How many times uh, do you have vegetables uh, every week and stuff like that? Now, here's the problem with that. People lie. Information isn't perfect. They have the information. You don't. That's why it's asymmetric. You're the insurance company. Don't. But the person who's, you know, being insured, they kind of know whether they're healthy or not. But they know that you're going to charge less money if they're uh, if, if you think that they're healthy, so that's why everyone's going to lie and say that they're healthy. So if you sort of overlooked that and sort of gave everybody the, and you're like, oh, I guess everybody's healthy and charge them the low premium. Well, now you're actually having to pay on average more because some people are unhealthy, right? Even though they lied. But that's called adverse selection. Adverse just kind of means bad. So this is bad selection. You selected the bad people to get the sort of a healthy person pr low premium, but they're really unhealthy. So that's when you made a bad decision. Now, one easy way to kind of get rid of that is rather than relying on them reporting the truth, is screening. If you were able to screen everybody, meaning if you were to just say, hey, you know what? Rather than you filling out a survey, how about I'll just do like a physical, like I'll just hire a doctor to do a physical for all my, uh, you know, people that I'm insuring, and the doctor will tell me how healthy they are, and based on that, I'll know. And so then there's, you, there's no adverse selection anymore. So screening is one way. Another is signaling. That's where the, you know, the client themselves, you know, the person being insured can kind of signal that, hey, look, I really am healthy. I've been in all these 10K races and whatnot. So either way, screening or signaling can fix adverse selection. Moral hazard, though, 
that's a little, that's like even a slightly deeper problem. Let's say you were able to avoid adverse selection, meaning you got all the healthy people uh, to pay the low premium and you were able to get the, uh, uh, the unhealthy people to pay the high premium, right? And now all's good with the world. The doctors confirmed this person's healthy, so you can charge them a low premium and they probably won't have to go to the doctor a lot. So you're like, yay. But now that person, that otherwise healthy person, now they go home, first they have having health insurance and they're thinking, I guess it's okay if I skip the gym today because hey, worst case, if I get a little sick, I mean, I don't have to pay any medical bills. So, I mean, a lot of people don't think like that, but a few might. And either way, when somebody does, that's called a moral hazard. So a moral hazard to generalize is whenever anybody becomes riskier just because they have uh, insurance. Now, it could go beyond health insurance. You could say if somebody's like, you know, oh, now that they've bought cars, so like an otherwise safe driver, if you didn't have health, uh, like car insurance, you drive really safely because I don't want to pay $10,000 in car repairs. I'm driving really safely. But now you're thinking if you have uh, car insurance and it's all covered anyways, you're thinking, ah, I might as well speed a little bit. Worst case, if I, as long as I don't die, I mean, the car company is going to pay for, the insurance company is going to pay for all the damages. So either way, it changes your behavior and uh, makes you more risky. Unlike adverse selection where it's not really changing your behavior, that's just you not identifying who's whom. Here, this is saying it's gonna make everyone uh, riskier. And finally, let's look at present value. Now, present value is just a way for us to be able to compare two different options that you might be facing where there's some time inconsistency. One is at a different time than the other, so it's not clear which option might be better. For example, let's say Somebody again wants to give you some money and they're giving you a few different options and you're kind of trying to wonder, hey, you know, which one should I take? So let's say one option is that they're just going to give you $1,000 right now. That's it. Another option is let's say that they're going to give you $2,000, but it's three years from now. And a third option is that they're going to give you 300 bucks a year starting now, let's say for 40 years or something. So now... Here's, the, here's why it's not obvious which option is the best. It's because money in the future is kind of not worth as much as it is today, right? Because if you were given money today, I mean, not only is there the impatience factor, but you also could just put it in a bank account or something and start earning interest on it. So here, that's why $1,000 today is way better than if I were to say, hey, I'll give you $1,000 a year from now. Because let's say the interest rate is 12%. If, uh, if I were to give you a thousand now, as opposed to a thousand a year from now, by taking the thousand now, you could just put it in a bank and a year from now, you'll have another $120 in the bank account. So that's better than if I were to just give you a thousand a year from now. This way you get 1120 a year from now. So, you know, a thousand plus 120. So either way here, the way to evaluate these options are to put them all in terms of today's dollars, right? So what would the equivalent be in cash right now? Now, the present value, here's the grand formula, the present value of X dollars given to you N years from now is this, is X divided by one plus R to the N. Now, one thing about this formula is you can clearly see that N, the number of years into the future you actually get the money, the bigger that N is, that's a bigger denominator, which means an overall smaller number. That's why money given in the future is kind of not worth it. If you were to say, what's, what's more valuable? $100,000 given to you five years from now or $100,000 given to you 30 years from now? Well, the one given to you 30 years from now is really not worth that much to you right now, right? So uh, the sooner, the better, the higher the present value of it's sooner, if it's a lower end. In fact, what if the end, what if you were given that money right now? The end is zero, zero years from now. Well then, the present value of X dollars given to you zero years from now, I'll just plug in zero for N, anything to the zeroth power is one. So that's just X over one, so it's just X. Which means, for option A, the present value is simply gonna be $1,000 because $1,000 given right now is 1,000 over one, you know, to the zero, or whatever that is to the zero. So now, we want to compare the present value of this guy to a thousand. So the way we're going to find it is you're given two thousand dollars. So that's your x, two thousand dollars. You're given how many years from now? Three years from now. Now here's what this is: the larger the interest rate, that's kind of like how much money you could have earned, right? It's like your opportunity cost. It's what you're giving up. Now, the more you're giving up, the less the present value, right? So if the interest rates in the world are really high, 
like you can get like 50% interest, then you'd really much rather have the money now so you could put it in the bank and get interest out of it, right? So if somebody's like waiting more into the future to give you that money, then it's really not worth that much because you're losing all that interest. So that's why in this case, if the interest rate's 12%, then that's one plus 0.12. So that's 1.12, in this case, to the third. So whatever that is, notice it's not obvious. We already know that that's gonna be less than 2,000 because you're dividing by a number bigger than one, but it's not obvious what that number is. So you do the math and you know, you'd be able to find that. And then for this one, for option C, you're given 300 a year starting now for four years. So this is a little bit weird, but it's really just an application of this. Let's see, you're given $300. The first $300 that you're given is zero years from now. So the present value is of that $300 is just 300 divided by, you know, 1.12 to the zero, so it's just 300. But then the 300 bucks that you get a year from now, so here's the thing, at the end of the day, your temptation might be to say, wait, isn't this just worth 1,200 bucks, 300 a year for four years, so 300 added four times? But here's the thing, all these 300s aren't created equally. They're given to you in different time periods. This is given right now, so its present value is 300. This is a year from now, so it's divided by 1.12. That's two years from now, so that's 1.12 squared. That's three years from now, so that's 1.12 cubed. So notice, the more into the future it is, the lower the present value. So in conclusion, if we actually do the math, it turns out that looking at these three present values, the best thing is option B, because 1423 is bigger than 1020, 0.5 and 1,000. So this is like the most preferred. And then if you have to choose between A and C, notice it's not obvious. A thousand bucks versus 1,200. But the 1,200 is you know over time, you know, so it's not clear whether it was gonna be worth more than the thousand. And here it just barely made the cut, so that is better than the thousand. So this is the worst in this case. Now let's look at some student questions. Would a risk-averse person ever want to gamble? Or does gambling automatically make you risk loving? Hmm, good question. If the gamble sort of has the same expected value, if the two options in your gamble have the same expected value, well, then a risk averse person would definitely not choose to gamble. But in general, in life, I mean, you really, uh, even a risk averse person might choose to gamble if the numbers are right. Like, for example, if you had to choose between, you know, there's a, an option A where you get, you know, $10 for sure, you know, no questions asked. And an option B where, you know, there's like a 50% chance that you get, you know, that you get a million dollars, heads or tails, 50% million dollars. And then a 50% chance that you get, you know, uh, let's say just five, but $5 or something like that. Um, or even zero, really, either way, if you think about it, this is a gamble, right? And this is not a gamble at 10 bucks. But even if you're risk averse, this has such a high expected value that you're still okay to gamble, even though overall we'd still classify that person as risk averse. Uh, we just wouldn't know it based on this choice. We'd need a lot more other info. We'd need to see how they react when two things have the same expected value. Only then we, can we say for sure that they're definitely risk averse. But in general, yeah, risk averse people might gamble if the thing has a high expected value. Now our final question, isn't money in the future worth more than money today? Movie theater tickets used to be a nickel and now they're worth $8. So here's the thing, if you think about it, it might seem like, oh yeah, you know, money's, you know, there's a lot more money today, so it does, isn't that more? Here's the thing, if, because there's a lot more money, it's, it's actually worth less in the sense that each dollar doesn't go as far. Back in the day, again, when it was a nickel for a movie theater ticket, a dollar goes so far, it buys you 20 tickets. But now, like years later, that same dollar is not really worth much. Although that's really getting at more of inflation, so that's more of macroeconomics. But in general, uh, because you're sort of losing out on all the opportunities to invest and earn money, in general, each dollar, so although there's more dollars in the future, when you, you know, even invest money into a bank account, that doesn't really mean that the future value is more. It's like a higher number amount, but each dollar is sort of worthless. It goes not as far as it does today. So that's why actually uh, dollars in the future are actually worthless. Each dollar is worthless. Well, I hope you now understand economics better. And if you really want to make sure you've mastered the concept, check out our active learning customized platform at bestecontutor.com. It's like having a one-on-one -on -one tutor right in front of you 24-7. You can click here to try it out for free. 
and we'll be adding more topics and videos on YouTube, so make sure you subscribe below for the latest updates.